So the date is July 1st, 2016. Let's start with asking our Heavenly Family to bless us. Eloheinu, Heavenly Family, Toda, thank you so much. Thank you for this beautiful day. Mm-hmm. Thank you for blessing us so abundantly, so much more than we even realize. As we enter into the subject of this meeting, Heavenly Family, please guide us to understand the principles at work in the community rule and to understand the principles involved in investigating the community rule. Please guide us to gain a coherent knowledge of the truth. Thank you so much for guiding us with all these things. Bless everyone on the call, Heavenly Family. Send angels to them. Give them the atmosphere of heaven. And um, all those who are not on yet but who uh, should be on the call, please bring them to be able to join and to enjoy and to benefit from the wonderful lessons that you have for us. Amen. Toda avoti. Thank you, my parents. We ask these things, Bashem Semach. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, I think it will be good for us to continue our investigation of the community rule, seeing as there's so much that relates to it. Um, Before Getting into it, though, I'll mention something. I've mentioned this to those here at the Living Branch Center already, but I wanted to mention it to the rest of you guys, too. Um, A while back, uh, we posted on the Branch Davidian SDA Facebook page that the Israel Antiquities Authority is searching for more Dead Sea Scrolls. Also, I think I've mentioned on a recent call that there are more Dead Sea Scrolls to be published that are already found. Um, There have been some scrolls published this year already that had never been published before. Um, So I recently found out that uh, James Charlesworth, he, he is the editor of the OTP, the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, Um, So some of you guys have the two volumes, the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha, edited by James H. Charlesworth. Uh, So he's been heavily involved with Dead Sea Scroll research for a number of decades now. And um, I saw, I guess you could call it an announcement to some extent, by him that there's some scrolls that he has had or that he has been aware of and been dealing with for however long And come this September, there will be a volume published uh, by Princeton Theological Seminary with these scrolls. Um, He mentioned that there's 40 or over 40 of them. I don't know if they will all be published in this volume, but there's going to be at least some of them. And maybe all of them. I just don't know one way or the other if it's all of them or not. He wasn't able to say that much, but we're looking forward to it. We know at least some of the things that are in it. It includes some of the best, if not the best, manuscripts of Exodus. And it also includes what are supposed to be better manuscripts of at least portions of Deuteronomy. So that's pretty cool, and I don't know what else is in there. There may be writings that we've never heard of before. So I just, seeing as our Heavenly Family has guided us to pay close attention to these things, um, it's good to keep up to date and to know what is coming and uh, it may be of great significance. So I thought I would mention that before we get into the community rule. Um, In the community rule, the part that we're looking at, I believe, is... Um, 
Yes, we were looking at column four of 1QS, describing the attributes of the way of truth or the way of light. So before getting into this, does anyone have any comments or questions? All right, well, I guess there are no comments or questions. So, um, again, this is 1QS, column 4, and the paragraph starts at around line 2 or 3. And I'll just read the whole paragraph again, and we will... Um, recap briefly what we looked at last weekend and then continue on from there. So we just explained how there are two ways or two spirits, one of truth and one of error. It's also referred to as the spirits of light and darkness. Light relating to truth, darkness relating to error. And now it is describing their ways in the world. So first, it starts with the, the spirit of truth. These are their ways in the world. First, one is for the enlightenment of the mind of mankind, and so that all the paths of true righteousness may be made straight before him and so that the fear of the laws of God may be instilled in his heart. It is a spirit of humility, patience, abundant love, unending goodness, understanding, and intelligence, a spirit of mighty wisdom which trusts in all the deeds of God and leans on his great loving kindness, a spirit of discernment in every purpose, of zeal for just laws, of holy intent with steadfastness of heart, of great love towards all the sons of truth, of admirable purity which detests all unclean idols, of humble conduct sprung from an understanding of all things and of faithful concealment of the mysteries of truth. These are the foundations of the Spirit to all the children of truth in this world. All right, so we looked at the first bit of this last week. The spirit of truth, the spirit of light, the way of truth, is for the enlightenment of the mind of mankind. So we talked about that and how the truth is represented by light and being illuminated, being enlightened, how it shows us the way things really are. Just like if you turn on light, you can see the way things really are, whereas if you're in darkness, you can't see how things really are. That's why darkness is such a great symbol for lies, for falsehood, for error. So the way of truth is for the illumination, the enlightenment, of the mind of mankind. So it's our way of thinking. It illuminates our way of thinking. So truth is basically um, a mental construct which corresponds to reality. And so that all the paths of true righteousness may be made straight before him. So the idea here is that the truth makes straight before us all the paths of true righteousness. In other words, 
it clears the way, it makes it plain to us, and makes us able to walk in it. The truth makes us able to walk in the paths of true righteousness. So those are the two aspects that we discussed last weekend. If anyone does have any other comments to make concerning them, uh, then please do mention so. But otherwise, we'll move on to the next aspect. It says, And so that the fear of the laws of God may be instilled in his heart or in his mind. So in other words, the spirit of truth is given so that the fear of the laws of God may be instilled in his heart. That is the heart of mankind. Are there any comments or questions concerning that phrase? Or if anyone would like to explain what they understand this uh, part to be saying. I think Carol was going to say something. Well, I was just going to say that it's talking about justification by faith when the laws are written on our heart. Um, you know, when when the, the fear, the respect of the laws of God are instilled in our heart, that brings about true righteousness. Amen. So the truth brings that about. Do you guys uh, understand what the fear of the laws of God is? To hate evil. To hate unrighteousness. To fear the fear the consequences. It is the truth. Before we have the truth, we are carnal. You know, we have no fear of the Lord. When we learn the truth, it puts out our hatred of God's law, and, and we're filled with God's spirit, which is the truth, the spirit of truth, knowing the truth. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts? Well, if we fear the laws of God, we understand that we are judged by whether we keep the law, and we understand that they're good laws and just laws, and that they're deserving of following or living up to. Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, so God is going to destroy evil. He's going to restore righteousness in the world. So if we fear fear God is to know that we won't be around if we're still unrighteous when he does away with unrighteousness. To love what he loves and hate what he hates. Amen. I'd like to read a little bit from the Silver Trumpet, Volume 1, Numbers 15 and 16, um, because it talks about this a little bit, and I think it'll be good for a reminder uh, as to what it is to fear the Lord. And, of course, that's connected to the idea of fearing the laws of God, because the law of God is the instruction of God. So you cannot... Fear the instruction of God without fearing God, and you cannot fear God without fearing his instruction. So first, um, I'll read Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And this is on page 21 of the Silver Trumpet, volume 1, numbers 15 and 16. For any of you guys who want to note this, My child, if you receive my words and store up my commands within you by making your ear attentive 
to wisdom and by turning your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for discernment, raise your voice for understanding. If you seek her like silver and search for her like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of Yahweh and you will discover the knowledge of Elohim. Okay, so if we receive the words and the commands given to us through inspiration, if our ear is attentive to wisdom, if we turn our heart or our minds to understand, if we call out for discernment and for understanding, if we seek wisdom like silver and like hidden treasure, then we will understand the fear of Yahweh. This is very important. So if you find yourself not understanding the fear of Yahweh, that should be an indication to you that, hey, wait a second, I haven't been receiving the words of inspiration and giving my ear to wisdom, to be attentive to wisdom. I haven't been calling out for discernment to raising my voice for understanding and seeking her like silver and like <clears throat> hidden treasure and so on. So this, this is um, very, very important. A little bit later, this is in the Silver Trumpet, Volume 1, Numbers 15 to 16, page 23. This is what it says, paragraph 2. What is the fear of Yahweh? It is the opposite of breaking the third commandment. To take the name of the Lord in vain is for someone to come to you in the name of the Lord, but rather than receiving it, quote, as it is in truth, the word of God, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse um, 13, you receive it as the word of man. So you see how that's what it is to break the third commandment. It's to, you know, someone comes to you in the name of the Lord, but you take that in vain. They come to you in the name of the Lord, they're bearing a message from the Lord, but you don't count it as from the Lord. You count it as merely the word of man. The fear of Yahweh is the opposite of that. Uh, on page 24 of the Silver Trumpet, Volume 1, Numbers 15 and 16, it says... To have the fear of the Lord means that when a message comes to you in the name of the Lord, you hear it as from the Lord. You do not account the name in which it comes as useless or vain. I think that's pretty straightforward. A very straightforward. Um I'm grateful for the uh, reminder of where that's found in the Silver Trumpet because I did not remember that. Awesome. Yeah, very, very important. So, so the truth, in this statement in the community rule, the truth, what it does is it comes to us so that the fear of the laws of God may be instilled in our hearts or in our minds, in our way of thinking. So the truth then, if we receive it, that is, will cause us to become very mindful of inspiration, the instruction of God. Again, even um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is recorded as saying, is it not written in your law? And then he quotes Psalm 82. You know, the law is not the Pentateuch. The law, the Torah, is the instruction of our heavenly family through their messengers, whoever they may be, whenever they may be, wherever they may be. Amen. That makes so much sense. Absolutely. And that's the only thing it could be, really. 
Amen. So does that saying make sense to you guys? Does that, um, the last part that we're going through, this, this particular characteristic of the spirit of truth, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's. I was thinking about the rich young ruler, and he was like, I kept the law, and that would be an example of the way I described, you know, what was being said here. And But he didn't uh, recognize the voice of God. He didn't recognize the instruction, you know, coming to him from our heavenly family. And, you know, I was just thinking about Seventh-day Adventists, you know, who proudly say, um, you know, this is the group of people that keep the commandments of God, have the testimony of Jesus. And, but it has to be, you know, in this way. They have to have this, the fear of, of instruction from our heavenly family instead of just, you know, simply the Ten Commandments. I, I, I know I've heard you say, use the word instruction for law before, but it really is having an impact in my mind now. Amen. Toda Elohenu. Thank you, Heavenly Family. So people that don't respect the spirit of prophecy are not keeping the law, then it sounds like. Absolutely, yes. Well, and you know, it, it could be... Uh, exemplified by someone who takes the teaching from the spirit of prophecy into their mind, but then they don't allow it to change them. You know, that could be considered taking the name of the Lord in vain. Because you can say, you know, like those in um, Ezekiel 33, I believe it was, you know, come and listen to this guy. He has wonderful things to say. It's beautiful and blah, blah, blah. But then if you don't take it to heart, then really you're just lying. Right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's to take the name of the Lord in vain is one way of receiving the grace of God in vain. Receiving the grace of God in vain is a bit broader, but this is certainly one example, and unfortunately it's a very common way of receiving the grace of God in vain. All right, well, um, let us move on to the next part of this then. And again, if anyone has any further comments on any particular aspect, as we are about to move into the next aspect, feel free to voice it. Okay, so the next part, it says, it is a spirit of humility. So what do you guys think of that? The spirit of truth is a spirit of humility. Not prideful. Devoid of Amen. self. Being like a little child, teachable. Amen. So how does the idea of truth relate to humility? Because this is saying that and it's describing what truth is, or what the spirit of truth is, rather, and how it impacts us. Um, so how does truth and humility, or how, how do truth and humility relate one to another? Well, that's happening right now is a perfect example of that, because right now, you know, the, the spirit is giving us instruction and she's saying, you know, if the shoe fits, wear it. And, you know, you may be taking the name of the Lord in vain. And so if we take that in, that makes us humble. Should. Amen. 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 When, we, when we realize the truth about ourselves, just as you were saying, Carol, and contrast that with the truth about God, who could be proud? Amen to that. Yeah. It is 
the truth is humbling, if nothing else. It is a, it is a release, a relief, and a joyous thing to comprehend. But it humbles the honest truth seeker. Yeah, that's that's along the lines very, very much of what I've been thinking in relation to this, that if we learn the truth about ourselves and about other things, we will recognize how we really aren't all that magnificent in the sense of, you know, we don't have the greatest accomplishments. We haven't been the most loving. We, we've actually miserably failed. That's the truth of it. That's the truth. We have miserably failed. Ezekiel 16. Yeah, absolutely. Ezekiel 16 shows that so plainly. And learning the truth about other things, about reality in general, about the past, about the message of our Heavenly Family, it shows us how little we know. You know, a little bit earlier today, we were talking about how, well, I was relating my experience in coming to, to view the Bible, how I now view the Bible and how different that is from how I used to view the Bible. And I used to view the Bible in a a way that led me to open it up and read it and have a very high degree of confidence concerning the truth of everything that it says. And I, I I could pick it up and read any part of it and feel very confident that every detail of everything that is said in every place in the Bible is exactly right. And that, that degree of confidence, though it was there, it was lacking in understanding. And I, I now recognize that I did not actually know any of it. I had no genuine knowledge of the truth of any of those things. Yes, I could tell the story that's in Scripture. I could relate the facts and have confidence or perceived confidence that those things are the way that it is written. But I had no genuine knowledge of it. I didn't even know what knowledge was. And I didn't know how to obtain it. None of that. I just believed it strongly, and so I felt confident. Then comes the truth. The truth comes along and pulls the rug out from under my feet, and I recognize that I haven't really known any of it. And so now, the confidence that I have or that I had in thinking I know certain things is no longer there. Not that I discount the things which I thought I knew. I just recognize that I don't know them. Um, But what is happening is that through learning what our Heavenly Family has been giving to us in terms of the principles of truth and righteousness, I am actually now acquiring genuine knowledge about the past, about the scriptures, about the nature of reality. It's genuine knowledge, knowledge that can be demonstrated, knowledge that arose from careful experimentation, and so on. And so, all all of this, it really is a humbling experience. And the spirit of truth is a spirit of humility because in truth, 
we have failed. In truth, we barely know anything. <laughs> and we need a lot of help. That's the truth of it. Simply recognizing that truth and settling into that truth brings about humility. Amen. Amen. I'd, I'd like to uh, comment on that idea of humility. I've been listening to um, the first part of the studies that you gave on Galatians in 2014 and just thinking a lot about the gospel and connecting that um, with the idea that of, of purity zone. So we need to be in a high enough purity zone so that we can go to the altar and offer sacrifice. Well, you know, that, sound, that, can, that can become another one of our cliches that we say and, you know, think we understand, but... Um, Really, what we have to, it's about the truth, of course. And so it's the truth that um, makes us want to go to the altar. And what do we do at the altar? Well, we lay our lives down. We give up all. And we make the death, and we make the death of Christ our own. So, you know, that's what we're talking about there. That's just you know, very, very connected to humility, which is what we get from the truth. Amen. So the next aspect is patience. It is a spirit of patience. So how does truth relate to patience? When we know how God loves us, even when we're being, uh, couldn't be worse, and yet God humbly keeps on loving us, not the way we love each others. It makes us mm-hmm. want to be like him. Mm-hmm. Amen. That's exactly. That's exactly right, Roy. When I think of how how far off the mark I was when I say I was I am how far off the mark I am compared to our heavenly family why why should I why why what gives me the right to be impatient with my brother When God suffered so long, is suffering so long for me. Amen. 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 (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's the reality of it. The, The truth is that we ourselves require a lot of patience on the part of our heavenly family and the heavenly intelligences who they send. We require a whole lot of patience. And you know what? That patience on the part of our heavenly family is worth something. They find it to be worth something. That's why they're patient. Because it can make a difference to us. A huge difference. That's the truth of ourselves. The truth for others is that if we are patient with them, then it also can produce. It gives a huge opportunity to produce amazing results, which may be the salvation of their own soul. It may be their means of being part of the kingdom. That's the truth of it, that us being patient with another person may result in their salvation. That is hugely important. So the spirit of truth demands patience. We're all changed by beholding either one way to the good way 
or to the bad way. It's, but that's just the way we are. We become like what we look at and eat and dwell upon. And it's, it's this law of truth. Amen. And our heavenly family doesn't expect anything of us that they don't have in themselves. You know, um, like all of these attributes that we're talking about here, that's what our heavenly family is like. Those are their attributes. And it's, it's like we're supposed to become like little children, you know, and a little child looks up at their mother and they just go, I want to be like you. Right? Mm-hmm. Amen. Mm-hmm. Be ye holy. Amen. And Jesus is our example who did no sin. As your Father Amen. in heaven is holy. Right, he's a perfect image and likeness of his Father in heaven. That we can look at. We are his image. We should act like. Amen to that. Absolutely. But because we've been believing all this unrighteousness and lies about God and the truth, we're changed by that into being what we are. You know, we've believed that the world, what the world teaches, that you've got to be on top. You've got to be in charge. You've got to be in control. <laughs> the only person that has it right is the one who's serving his brothers and his sisters, serving God, serving the needy, serving the needs of others. That's what true love is. Not love of self, but love of what's right. Love of righteousness. Love of the way, the ways of truth. The way that's in the sanctuary. It's the happiest way. Amen. I love reading about the way and seeing the distinction between the way of truth and the way of falsehood. The distinction is so evident and so plain, especially when laid out like this, as it is in the community rule. The next um, attribute or characteristic of the way of truth that it lists here is abundant charity or abundant love. Charity is a, an older way to say love. So abundant love, how does that relate to truth? It's the basis of truth mm-hmm. in a sense, and it's, it's the basis of all instruction. It's the heart from which all instruction love if you love me keep my commandments you know as you were saying Carol the the basis the thought came into my mind when Jesus said I am the Alpha and the Omega it's not only the basis of the truth it's the result of the truth it's the product of truth it's the beginning and the end of truth you know, it's what happens when you're saturated with truth. You become abundantly charitable, abundantly loving. You can't do anything else when the truth takes over. When your your mind is renewed by truth. It's the result. As you said, though, but it, it has to be there to foster itself in you, right? So it comes in and then it is multiplied and comes back out again. It 
like you well, can't and, have and righteousness is pure un, unadulterated truth and there is no righteousness without love because you know every act of law keeping has to be has to flow from a heart of love or it's not righteousness at all not law keeping at all what love what is it? the truth <laughs> What was it Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, a spring of water that would never go dry or... She would never thirst again. Yeah, she would never thirst never again. Thirst again, yeah. This truth, it, 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 how do you say it? It multiplies, and the word multiplies, stuck, is stuck in my head. It multiplies within you and it overflows. It pours forth once it has established itself in you. Coming from the heavenly family, but it's like you're a conduit. Didn't we speak about conduits one time? That's the fastest way to spread something. One person tells two, and two people tell two more, and it's a few divisions, and you get trillions. I don't remember speaking about anything to do with conduit before, just in reply to your question earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't remember one way or the other on that either. But we are to be um, conduits of pathways for righteousness right right it, it's sounding kind of familiar I was talking about this on a previous call mm. in in that way I mean we've definitely talked about the general idea but mm. yeah you know it's interesting um, Carol as you mentioned about love being the foundation of truth the first thought uh, that entered my mind when you said that is that the reverse is true and the reverse is true, but it's not exclusive of both being true. Uh, it's just, like you said, you said in a sense. And so the sense in which love is the foundation for truth is viewing truth as the conception of the way things are. You know, the, the mental construct that corresponds to the way things are. Well, the reason to say truth to anyone, the message of truth, all of that has love as its foundation. The other way of viewing it uh, where truth is the way things are, it, that has truth as the foundation of love. In other words, and, you know, truth being the way things are is in fact, the foundation of all things. I mean, there's, there is, uh, nothing can precede the way things are because the way things are is always the way things are. That's just the way it is and was and will be. Um, but the way that love springs from that, it, it's kind of like how, how morality springs from that. You know, that which is good is that which is in harmony with reality or with truth. That which is bad is that which is against truth or reality. I won't go into all the details of that since we've talked about it a number of times on the calls before and also since it's on the FAQ page of the website now. Um, But here's the thing. Love is basically to do what is good. It's it's the motivating principle which brings about goodness. And so because of that, love is absolutely bound to truth, absolutely bound to reality. If someone is if someone doesn't have the truth Well, they, they're in a place where they will be operating contrary to reality, and that is only detrimental to them. Reality working against itself um, 
Again, it's detrimental. It just brings destruction. So the only loving thing to do is to give the person the truth. And love compels one to do so because love love brings about a restoration within reality. That's what it seeks to do. So it's interesting how it's, it's both aspects where truth is the foundation of love, but then in another sense, love is the foundation of truth. Both are beautiful and full of of practical lessons. Amen. I think it was Paul that said, if you love, he that loveth is keeping the law, even though he don't know the law. Amen. And I want to say about the conduit that the conduit is a way of something to flow, to carry carry something. So we should be conduits of love and truth. Amen. So the next aspect is unending goodness. That's it's saying that the spirit of truth, the spirit of light, is a spirit of unending goodness. What do you guys think of that? It ever widens. It it melts. It forget what that how that saying went. It'll melt the hardest ice chunk of ice. You know, somebody that's mean and ornery. If, if somebody loves him, he will eventually melt. One of the things that comes to my mind is the scripture which says. Do not grow weary of doing good. If you think about it, well, what what does that imply? If someone grows weary of doing good, is that loving? To grow weary of doing good? No. No, it doesn't make sense. Love demands continual goodness, unending goodness. Not growing weary of it, but just continuing to do good without end. And of course, since goodness is what corresponds to truth, what corresponds to reality, then it makes sense that the spirit of truth, the spirit of light, is a spirit of unending goodness. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get impatient. Sees sees other people like like God sees them as they will be when the truth is finish this job job in him. I'm reminded when someone uh, said to Jesus, a good, a good teacher, and he said, there's only one good, and that's the Father. Mm-hmm. Unending, unending goodness is continual connection to the Father. Amen. Now, our righteousness is only filthy rags, right? So the only way we can have goodness is to be connected to the heavenly family. Amen. And I I think it's interesting how you brought up that verse. You know, it highlights the fact that Christ, his works were not his own. He was just doing what the Father showed him. I mean, you know, that's what he's reported to have said in John. You know, that's that's certainly the principle by which Christ operated. He wasn't just doing his own thing. He was following the instructions of his Father. Our example. Amen. So the next aspect is understanding. So the spirit of truth 
is a spirit of understanding. What are your thoughts on that? I got a little short comment on the last out there that we're connected with God or the, or Jesus, His Son, or His sister, His representative, by learning the truth, the words that He that He uh, spoke. That's how we're connected with with divinity. Amen. Or abide in a divinity. Yeah. Abide with me and I abide with you and come in and we will sup together. Amen. The daily is so important. I got a comment on that. Before I started remembering the dailies, this world had so much of my life. I was, all my time was spent trying to do something for the worldly uh, side to benefit my pocketbook or, or to get something. But the daily helped you to obey what Sister White said, spend a thoughtful hour contemplating the love of God. So I love the daily. And I'm trying to, I'm not, and the seven times of prayer that David said, I'm trying to make it to as many of them as I can and just there, go right along with the daily. Amen. The daily is saving me from my my former life where I, all I could think about was doing things to, to uh, accomplish in this world of activity. And I'm enjoying it too. I, I can see it's doing me good. Amen. You know, mentioning about Christ's dependence on his Father and things like that, this is just reminding me of something that we've talked about a little bit here recently that I don't think we've talked about on the calls yet. So I thought it might be good to talk about it for a minute here. Um, and that is, what is the divinity of Christ? Uh, we all are familiar with the statements by Ellen White that Jesus was fully human and fully divine, that the natures were blended, and you know she makes different statements like this. Um, so the question is, what is the divine nature of Jesus. So maybe I'll just ask that first. What do you guys think? What is the divine nature that Jesus had while here on earth in sin-affected flesh? Sister White said he had, it seemed like he, he laid it aside because divinity can't die. I remember that, that part. So you're talking about how did his divinity manifest while he was on earth, right? Um, it depends what you mean by that. Um, what is his divinity? Like, what is his divine nature itself? His connection with truth, maybe. Well, he had... He had a divine nature before he came here, but then like Leroy said, he laid that aside. But then we know that he, while he walked on this earth, he had 
divinity that was blended with humanity. And I believe I read or heard somewhere recently that we are to have a blending of divinity with humanity as we accept the mind of Christ. So maybe I'm on the wrong track, but, um, you know, he... The way the way he operated um, was that he accepted the, the he accepted the mind of his father through his mother, you know, in the same way that we are to accept Christ's mind through our sister. Am I on the right track at all? Yeah, I think that you are so much on the right track that you don't even realize it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Oh. I was about to say it sounds really good to me. <laughs> yeah, but it it um no I mean yeah like I was saying it seriously you are on the right track to such an extent so much on the right track I I don't think you realize how right on the ball you are. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and it is very interesting how Ellen White talks about Christ laying aside his divinity or his divine nature and taking on humanity. And Paul says the same thing, too, that he laid aside his divinity. But then both Paul and Ellen White both say that Jesus was divine as a man walking among us. So he laid off divinity, but at the same time, he was still divine. So what's that about? How, you know, and Carol, you mentioned about Jesus being a divine being before coming here, you know, before coming here and actually becoming Jesus while he was the son of God one who is like God, you know, pre-incarnate, he was a divine being. And what did that mean? And how did that differ from how he was divine while walking among us? So what do you guys think about that? His father was walking with him maybe because he said, my my father and I will, will after he said his, the, the uh, comforter would come. And a few verses later, I think he says, my father and I will come and dwell with you. Sounds like we can partake of a measure of divinity ourselves. Yes, absolutely. That is one of the keys to understanding what that is, what the divine nature is. Because Jesus, Jesus is our example, so he showed us how to do it, right? How to have the, the mind of yeah. Christ right? and have him abide in us. Well, hmm. So when Jesus and the, his Father dwelt with us, it was through the Spirit of Truth, wasn't it? So having the Spirit of Truth would be to have the divinity. Yeah, I think that all of you guys are actually, you know, right around the the reality of it. Um, although I think that expressing it in a certain way may help to draw out the point more clearly. So here's the thing. There's, as you guys know, there is a lot of debate over the nature of Christ and things like that. In Adventism, outside of Adventism, all throughout Christianity, there's been a debate on this for so, so long. Of course, the... One of the views concerning the divinity of Jesus is that his soul was divine. You know, this is one explanation for how he can be 100% human and 100% divine. Uh, the explanation is that, well, when Adam sinned, he had a, a non-physical part of him, his soul, and it became infected with sin. And Adam and Eve passed that infection on to their children and it, gone, it went all the way down through the generations. And then Mary, by a miracle, was born without a, a sin-infected soul. 
And then, thus she was able to give birth to Jesus, and he just had a pure divine soul, not a sin uh, infected soul. And so that's one explanation of how he's both human and divine. But Others there, speak to... But, go ahead. But there is no non-physical. Absolutely. So we definitely reject that explanation as to how Jesus could be both human and divine. Um, another explanation that people give is, well, he was human and divine because with the the virgin birth, or more specifically the virgin conception, you know, the divine sperm or whatever, you know, was implanted into Mary. Well, that wouldn't end up with having someone who is fully human and fully divine. That would result in someone who is half human and half divine. Just like, you know, if you have... Um, I'll use an example of uh, people who are here at the Living Branch Center. <clears throat> if you have two parents, one being Jamaican, one being Filipino, well, the children aren't going to be fully Jamaican, fully Filipino. The children are going to be half Jamaican, half Filipino. You know, just you know, that's just an example. You have anything like that. Any of us who have parents who are different in any regard from each other, you know, we are, you know, if it's two different ethnicities or cultures or whatever, we will be basically um, half one, half the other. That's why we use, use the expression. So that's the thing, you know, if Jesus was really the product of his father's sperm and Mary's egg, that would be the situation. So what does it mean then for Jesus to be fully human and fully divine? Well, the fully human aspect is the part that is most often ignored. People typically don't grasp that. So we know, like in Hebrews chapter 2 and in many, many other places, it tells us about Jesus' human nature. You know, it tells us that as much as the sons and daughters are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same. Hebrews chapter 2. So it's, it's telling us ju that just like we are partakers in flesh and blood, we have the mortal nature that we have, that he also himself likewise, took part in the same. Every word there is important. It's emphasizing so much how his body was just like our bodies. You know, his epigenetic history, in other words, the, the exercise of certain genes by his parents or his, you know, forefathers, so to speak, going beyond just the first generation of parentage, going back and back many generations. You know, his epigenetic history, which is his, um, it's the history of how each generation in his parentage um, behaved and how they, by their behavior, influence certain, certain genes to be either active and, or inactive or strong or weak. And now he was born with that epigenetic history. He was born with the reality that some of his genes were stronger, some were weaker, some were more active, some were less active. And he had in his flesh inclinations to do certain things that were not good. Now, of course, he didn't give into it, but he, he had those inclinations in his flesh, just like anyone else. You know, Jesus walking around, I mean, Ellen White, she says that Jesus' disciples did not even begin to understand his divinity until after the great day of Pentecost. So he's walking around, he looks like everyone, 
He talks like everyone. He smells like everyone. He's a regular human being. So tell us that his body, his flesh, and his blood, his physical nature is the same as ours. He was fully human. So now here's the question. Is it coherent? Does it make sense to say that Jesus is fully human as to his physical nature and that he is fully divine as to his physical nature? No. Amen. It doesn't make sense, right? The fact is, someone cannot be, I mean, you know, he was fully divine as to his physical nature before the incarnation. That's the divinity that he laid aside. He stripped himself of divinity. I forget, I wish I could remember the exact wording that Paul uses. But, yeah, he he forsook that divine nature. And he took on humanity. He was fully human as to his physical nature. So, what was it then? What other nature is there that he had that was divine? Can I take a stab at it? Sure. Go ahead. I I think it's what we're studying right here. It's his character. He had the fear of the law of God. He had humility and patience and charity and goodness and uh, understanding and intelligence and, and on and on as we read here. And that's all available to us. Can I read Second Peter 1, 4? Yes, please. It's so exciting. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having uh, escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Amen. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, amen, both to the verse and to your comment, uh, Mike, and also to your comment, Carol, of that is so exciting. You just put a huge smile on Teresa and my faces. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the let's, let's thank the Heavenly Family right now. Amen. Heavenly so Family. Not the Heavenly Family, you're so good. You're so kind. And you're so generous. We would be nothing without you. Thank you so much. Amen. All we have comes from you. Amen. Uh, what about the whole, the uh, comforter or the spirit that hovered hovered over Mary was that where where she got what you're talking about? Somehow she made it possible for him to be born without a father, a human father anyway. Sorry, I I missed. What exactly you're saying? But I I just wanted to go back for a moment, if you don't mind, Leroy. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was I was just wanting to just express how you know that is the divinity of Christ. It's His way of thinking. Mm. That's it. That's the divinity that Christ had, and that's why it's available to us today. And that's why Peter can have that statement about us becoming partakers of the divine nature. That really demystifies it. It's not some combination of, you know, two different kinds of beings in Christ, nor is it some combination of two different kinds of beings in us, nor is it some non-physical substance or non-physical soul or anything like that that dwells within us that we can have changed... um, that ends up being our quote-unquote divinity that we can partake in, nor was that his divinity. It's simply that he thought divine thoughts, that he had the way of thinking of his father and mother. We can become partakers of the divine nature 
by the same means. Amen. Amen. What a precious, precious gift. I think um, we have this connection. We're chosen by our Heavenly Father and established in Christ by our Heavenly Father. So we're invited to have this divine connection. Amen. So I think that it's it's highly significant to understand the nature of Christ, how it's possible for him to be both fully human and fully divine. And it's really so simple when it gets down to it, although I can see how some people would be antagonistic to that thought, but again, there's no good reason to be antagonistic to it. It's just that we have had so many preconceived ideas as to how it must be, you know, one way or another. And, um, yeah, but it's, it's absolutely beautiful understanding good. Christ's nature and how we can partake of the same nature. Could you go over that again for my benefit? Sure. So the basic idea is that Jesus' divine nature is not in his physical nature. He is 100% human. That's often missed. That 100% human means 100% human. But he's also 100% divine. But his divinity is not in the same sphere as is his humanity. You know, he can't be 100% human as to his physical nature and 100% divine as to his physical nature. So if he's 100% human as to his physical nature, which definitely he is and was, then his divinity must be in another sphere, aside from the quote-unquote physical nature. In other words, not his body. Rather, it's his way of thinking. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. His way of thinking is his divine nature because his way of thinking is the way of thinking of his parents, his father and his mother. So that's really what Christ's divinity is and was. Does that help? Yes. As the more times I hear it, the better it will help. <laughs> is there another, another Amen. word? Amen. Is there, I want to be able to share with somebody else. Is there another word? Other than uh, his way of thinking, is it his char- character? And also, that's what we receive when we receive Christ, huh? or we receive God's way of thinking. Amen. Yeah, character is a fine way to describe it, Christ's character. His character, his way of thinking, you could say his mind, um, although Unfortunately, many people understand the word mind to be like a non-physical part of a person. That's why typically I say way of thinking, or you could say character. I was going to say the renewing of our minds, but I I agree with you about the concept of mind as being uh, non-physical. It's often misunderstood, you know, what the idea of a mind is. So it could be our way of reacting to how other people talk and do do to us, say things or do do things. It's, it's a different way of reacting than the human the human normally does. Much different. I think okay. there's a clue here in Second Peter one four, um, because it says and just this whole first chapter of Second Peter is really fabulous. But, um, okay, it says here in the NET, um, well, let me back up. That's okay. May grace and peace be lavished on you as you grow in the rich knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That's um, Second Peter 1, verse 2. And then it goes on in verse 3. I can pray this 
because his divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and godliness through the rich knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and excellence. Through these things, he has bestowed on us his precious and most magnificent promises, so that by means of what was promised, you may become partakers of the divine nature after escaping the worldly corruption that is produced by evil desire. So the worldly corruption that is produced by evil desire, those are the thoughts, those are the fleshly thoughts that originate with Satan. So, yeah, it's, it's the character that, um, you know, rejects those evil, selfish thoughts, right? Absolutely. Right. And could grace be the same? Could the word grace be talking about the same thing? It says, well, like Paul says, should we continue in sin that the grace, grace of God may abound, or something like that? So are you asking, like, um, grace is the same thing as, as what exactly? Are as, you as what we're talking about, the mind of Christ or the way of thinking. Okay. Well, is, the way of thinking is, of Christ is full of grace. You know, grace is unmerited love and affection, favor, um, and everything that is done within it. So... The mind of Christ is gracious, but I, I wouldn't say that the mind of Christ and grace are like equivalent terms. You know, they express different things, but one, um, one is a way of describing what the other is like. Amen. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was good discussing that aspect. Of course, there are more aspects here in the community rule um, concerning the spirit of truth. But maybe we should discuss that tomorrow night. Um, were there any last comments that anyone had concerning what we have talked about tonight? Well, one thing that I've always thought of in relation to uh, the divine... Some, you know, someone being divine or a divine being is the fact that they live forever. And so, but you know, if we take on the divine nature, that's how we um, gain eternal life. Mm-hmm. Amen. And of course, it doesn't mean that we um, won't ever experience death because, hey, someone could become a partaker and then die, but then the person would be raised to newness of life again and be able to live forever. So it is absolutely connected. Well, that makes me think of just the whole idea of um, our inherent mortality or immortality. And by inherent, obviously, it would have to have been given to us through creation. But I've often had these thoughts go through my mind, and I believe that I know the truth of it now, but, uh, you know, I used to think, oh, well, we were created immortal, even though I knew there was the whole tree of life thing. It just didn't quite connect. But we were, I believed, created immortal, and because of sin, then something metaphysically changed in our bodies. To make us able to die. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, over time it's gotten faster and faster with disease and all these different things that I thought um, were responsible for that. And, I mean, they, it's not that they're not. It's just that in relation to the whole metaphysical change thing um, I, or the idea of it, you know, when we are redeemed and we are... Um, given our new bodies, what that means is we will be healed of all of our infirmities. But I've always thought that that meant another metaphysical change. 
oh, well, now we'd be changed back into immortality, inherently immortal. But if there's still going to be a tree of life, and there is, according to my understanding of scripture there, that, you know, it will be um, there for a reason. And we will have immortality, but we've always been human. We've always been human um, before the fall, after the fall, same physical bodies, but sinning, doing things that corrupt our cells and our health and not having access to the tree of life has rapidly degenerated humanity. But when we are changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, it's not, you know, I, as I understand it now, it's not that we will be now transformed into some other type of being, no longer human flesh. We will still be human. We will still be human flesh, but no longer affected by sin, and now being allowed access to the tree of life. I like how Paul puts it: "This mortal shall put on immortality." In other words, it's it's not this mortal shall cease and we will become an immortal thing. It's this mortal shall put on immortality. Mm-hmm. So we were created mortal. We were not created immortal. And, yeah, so, yeah, it's true, getting access to the tree of life and all of that. Um, But we will be glorified. And I have to, I I know this is bringing up a topic that will probably need much prayer and discussion and study, contemplation, whatever. So I don't expect to get into discussion on it tonight. But... What does having immortality even mean? You know, all of a sudden I thought, well, wait a second, the only one who's immortal is God. Amen. But what does that mean? I've always thought immortal means that you cannot die. And if there was no chance of killing God, why would Satan even bother going to war? Well, there's a thought for you. If, if God's immortal, but it doesn't mean that he can't die, what is, what is that? And, yeah, so n- not a question that I expect that we have an answer to, but it's the first time that it's gone through my mind in quite that way. Teresa, uh, I had the thought to look the word immortal up in the dictionary. And I opened the Bible up to that, up to the Bible, opened up the dictionary to that page. Yeah. No, that's not a coincidence, okay? So I'm supposed to read the definition. And let's let's see if we can learn anything here. I haven't read it yet. Not subject to death, living forever. Two, having unending existence, eternal. Three, pertaining to immortality, or to beings or concepts that are immortal. Four, of enduring fame. And then the noun, that was adjective. The noun, an immortal being to the gods of classical mythology, right? Three, a person who has gained enduring fame. Immortality, unending existence or eternal fame. I I was wondering what the prefix M actually does to a word as far as the dictionary. Well, you would need to know what kind of root it is being taken from. Is it Latin? Is it something else? But, you know, you have the word mortal, and then you have the, the negative of that, immortal. So it would be negating it as far as I can tell, but I don't know which, um, like the etymology of the word necessarily. But I think that there is far more to it than we'll be able to glean um, tonight in our discussion. And I, I, excuse me. 
Well, I was just going to finish and say, and another um, kind of difficulty with the dictionary there is that it's using the actual word it's defining to try to describe the definition. <laughs> and that doesn't actually help to understand mm -hmm. the word. So there's a lot more that we would have to look into to really get to um, a real answer. One thing, one thing it did say, I think, was the connection to, you know, I closed the book, immortal, uh, pertaining to immortality, being the concepts of Anyway, um, the um, the connection to the tree of life, uh, I see there the connection to the heavenly family itself must be maintained even in eternity for you know immortality. You know, Satan. Amen. You know, you see. Satan and you know, all the angels, they they lived there. You know, well, well they were in heaven. And uh, they won't be immortal anymore. They lost it. Hey, says that Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden because um, if they were to eat of the tree of life after sinning, they would have become immortal sinners. Mm -hmm. But I've always thought in the past that that meant, oh, all mm -hmm. they had to do was eat one bite of it, mm -hmm. and boom, they'd be immortal. But they've had access to the tree of life all that time, and they were eating of it. But uh, they lived for many hundreds of years after sinning and after no longer having access to the tree of life. So it sounds to me more likely that the idea was not to have continual access to the tree of life to perpetuate um, a seemingly unending existence or an immortality. And so, you know, I was thinking of Satan and his followers and how they've been around for so long and I think that there have been wicked gods that have been killed. I don't think that all of the fallen angels are still alive. I think some of them have died in the battle. Mm -hmm. But um, those who are still alive are likely being sustained by some of that fruit that, you know. Now, I'm just thinking of it in realistic, rational terms, but it is still speculation as to, well, did they take fruit from the tree and, you know, what have you. But um, so it's, it's not very meaningful to continue on speculating in that line. But, you know, the point being that there's something um, necessary to partake of to perpetuate life for humanity and that we weren't created with immortality in the sense that inherently we cannot die. Mm -hmm. And if that's what immortality means, and if God is immortal, then why would Satan bother to battle for um, supremacy? And as we seek to understand reality more and more and to peel away any misunderstanding or false understanding that we've had, I'll be interested to see where we come to, you know, what our Heavenly Family really shows us definitively in this regard because I th there's definitely something there. Something that we, we need know, to do. We know that hellfire is reserved for Satan and his angels. Um, and um, also I've often thought that uh, Satan would probably use the access to the Tree of Life as an inducement to have the armies that surround the new Jerusalem to to do so, 
to, you know, tempt them with saying, like, if we can get to the tree of life, then, then you, you all can have immortality. Um, that being, him being the father of lies, you're going to consider that. But that's just a thought of mine. I, I've got nothing to back it up with. Amen. I've got a thought that we didn't talk about tonight, but I'll make it quick. It's in the new book on the Dead Sea Scrolls by Michael Wise, and it was a later translation, and he said it was after they had all of the scrolls. They weren't all discovered when the first group of scholars went over them. And on page five of the uh, introduction, it says some of the understandings or conclusions they come to with the first group disagreed with some of the things they found in the second uh, scholarly uh, looking at it. So anyway, if you get a chance to look at that, I, I just happened to pick it up and start reading it. It says, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Yeah, there's value in having multiple translations. I will say, though, that the Giza Vermez translation, there have been multiple editions. Um, mm -hmm. And in the later editions, it has the other scrolls that are, you know, in the translation by Michael Wise and everything like that as well. So I'm pretty sure the edition that we are all reading has all that information. Um, but... Even now, there's, like as we talked about at the beginning of the meeting, there's still more scrolls that are being published. There's already been two books this year with more Dead Sea Scrolls that had never before been published. And this September, there's going to be more scrolls that have never been published that are going to be published. And there's more scrolls that people are searching for uh, in the Judean desert. So I guess we'll see how it all uh, comes out and everything. And it will change things. I, I know there are certain things I like about the Michael Wise translation, um, but it seems to generally be more interpretive. It seems to be less close to the text. You know, not quite as literal of a translation, in other words. But like I said, there's some things that I like about it. Um, but if I want to see something that's a more faithful representation of the wording, then another translation... You know, there's the Dead Sea Scrolls study edition. Um, that one's more literal. And the Giza Vermez translation, at least in some places, and maybe most, is more literal. So it depends on the use. It depends on what you're using it for. Okay. Well, are there any last comments before we close off the meeting? did have a thought about um, Christ's uh, physical humanity. Uh, we have talked about it in the past, I, and if I remember correctly, there had been statements like uh, people, people believe that Christ walked through walls and he just disappeared and things like that. It seems like we, we discussed that and, and decided that that's a physical impossibility, and that the because of um, materiality, and that um, it was most likely that he had assistance of angels in these apparent uh, miracles. Um, and it just crossed my mind that when after he was resurrected, he was still physically human, at least in part. And, um, but, the, but the part that uh, really came to my mind, that was on my mind, was the walking on the water. And I think uh, we would have to lump that in with the other uh, supposed uh, physical miracles uh, that he that he himself did right like it, when he walked on water it wasn't a magic trick it was was he assisted 
by angels? Would you not believe? Uh, first, I just want to mention the other aspect. Um, we can say for sure that the post-resurrection Jesus was just as human as the pre-resurrection Jesus. You know, still, mm-hmm. still fully human in his mm-hmm. as to his physical nature, and still fully divine as to his um, mental nature or his character. Um, however, his human nature was different in that he was glorified so that his body was largely no longer affected by sin, but not entirely, because he still has the wounds. So it's kind of interesting how even that aspect has remained. Um, And, of course, even his side, too, as he he said to uh, Thomas. Um, And I I also wanted to mention that in Desire of Ages, Ellen White actually talks about those passages which people take to be Jesus walking through walls and everything. And she actually tells you, she describes how Jesus went into the room at the same time that the disciples did. He was just mm-hmm. unseen. He was just unseen. She, uh, she says that uh, they had an unseen friend with them. And did mm-hmm. you say there was angels one, one unseen, I don't remember anything about angels, but right. one unseen entered with them is how she put it. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me very briefly, but I, I won't, uh, we won't go into this too much because there's the walking on water thing. But um, Teresa came across a statement recently from Ellen White where she is talking about constructing buildings and making them large enough mm-hmm. for all the people that might be there, the human beings, and for all the angels. Now, that is a really interesting statement. You know, it's a very materialistic statement. You know, you're wanting something large enough for the people that will be there and for the angels. Well, that's definitely implying that angels occupy space. They take up space. <laughs> oh, I mean. You need it big enough to make room. So this, that's so materialistic. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, so in terms of walking on water... Uh, I can say for sure that nothing that Jesus did was a magic trick. Right. Um, So what we would have to do with the walking on water, I'll tell you, um, I, of course, in believing the Bible and so on and so forth, have believed absolutely that Jesus walked on water. But just like we were talking about earlier, I recognize now that I have not gained any genuine knowledge of that. That doesn't mean that I believe that he didn't. It just means that I have not gained genuine knowledge as to whether he did or didn't. And so, since understanding these principles, I have not investigated the question of walking on water, and so I cannot really comment on it in terms of, you know, specifically what happened, what didn't happen, how anything happened, if it did, and things like that. Um, There's several different ways it could be conceived of, though, and not be outside of the realm of reality or materiality. Well, it can be. Yeah. It has to be right. real. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, if Jesus walked on water, it was absolutely a totally physical thing. Um, and, and it was solid that, enough for him to stand on it. And, too, since the angels are real they may have participated. Anyway. Sure, I mean, Ellen they White... They would have had to. Yeah, Ellen White, she... Yeah. There are statements that she makes that implies that, basically, it was the angels with all of his miracles. Because he, I mean, if... Well, we'll put it this way. If we could walk on water without angelic help, then maybe he could too. But if we can't without angelic help, then he couldn't either. Oh, amen. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Compare that to the water stopping, you know, at the Red Sea. Or the water in Canada in the wintertime. You can walk on that water, can't you? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, can and and do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, 
we've been on for a while now, so we should uh, bring the meeting to a close, and there's plenty more to continue on with tomorrow night. Um, so if there are any last comments from anyone else, please do mention it. And if not, would someone like to volunteer to pray? I do want to thank everybody for their prayers. I think I'm really starting to come out of this fog of what's all that's been going on the last couple of months. And uh, thank you guys. I love every one of you. Amen. 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 Absolutely. And we love you too, Gary. I was going to call you Gary Mike. We love you too, Gary, though. <laughs> it's okay. That, that's not an insult. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Your prayers for me too. I'm coming out of the fog. Amen. I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Family, thank you so much for all you're teaching us. It's just astounding what we're learning. And we just ask that you would send angels to each one of us to help us to have these truths become a part of us, just like the garments on the priests. We want to be clothed with your righteousness, and we want to have the same nature that you partook of, brother, that when you were here by having your character. Thank you so much, and I ask that you would bless us all with a good night's sleep and a, a wonderful Sabbath tomorrow. I ask these things, and I pray these things in the name of Branch. Amen. 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 Amen.